I have decided to do spiritual warfare for every fifth Saturday class. We're going to do it in three parts, and you'll see it in a minute. I've been doing some study and really been uh, warning in the spirit with some atmosphere of things that must be together. You see, we're going to be covering today spiritual warfare through apologetics, and we'll explain to you, those of you who may not know what that term means, we're going to explain it in a minute. The next session will discuss spiritual warfare through prayer. And we're going to talk about how to war in the spirit in prayer. And then the last session this year, we'll talk about spiritual warfare through worship. So we've got, that's going to be the outline for the year. And in every, every uh, quarterly session, I'm going to teach you a different way of warring in the spirit and conducting spiritual warfare. Now, I need you to clear your minds first because I'm discussing things on spiritual warfare you probably have never heard before. And I want to dispel some things about what you may thought warfare was. And so that we can properly learn how to war in the spirit correctly. Because if we war in the spirit correctly, we can properly be effective. And I believe the body of Christ has got to be more effective than what we are. And we've got to do it by doing things right in terms of how to, how to uh, be able to war through apologetics first. And I think this comes first because it's important. We've got to know properly how to pray. I'm learning more and more that people really don't know how to pray. And so I'm, I'm sponsoring a bunch of prayer clinics this, this year at various churches. I've already got about maybe 15 churches lined up wanting me to come do prayer clinics. And I've got to teach their prayer warriors how to pray properly. So if you want to get me on your schedule, just let me know. I'll come and set up a prayer clinic for you and teach you how to uh, war in the spirit because it's important. The second session is going to be very timely for those of you who quote unquote think you're intercessors. Because so, I'm going to show you some things about really praying and praying in the spirit properly. Can I prepare you first before we start teaching? Um, I need to pray and prepare your hearts and minds because what I need right now is your mind. And I need you to open up your minds and your understanding. Father, I pray right now that as we begin this session that you open up our understanding, uh, prepare our minds and our hearts. That as we begin to move in your word, we move into your word with a knowledge base of understanding who you are. So that we can properly war against the devil and battle him on his battleground. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we give your name the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I chose the topic apologetics. It is a theological term, but one I think that we all need to become familiar with. And it's so important as we grab this whole idea of apologetics and begin to get some things together. Spiritual warfare, let's talk about that first. When Paul talks about spiritual warfare and his conflict with demonic forces and anti-biblical ideas, he uses military terms. And I think that's so important. Having a background in the military myself helps me a lot, too. We're ha getting these military terms together because Paul uses several military terms when he talks about warring in the spirits. For instance, in uh, Ephesians 6, he talks about putting on the whole armor of God. In uh, 2 Corinthians 10, you know, he talks about the weapons of our warfare. So he uses these military terms because we are in conflict. And you have to understand that the conflict is not visible, it is not physical, it is the fact that we have to understand that it is supernatural. It is a supernatural conflict. So, and one of the things, let me, let me give you a, a concept of Satan that you really have to understand. Satan is a, how can we call it, a shape shifter in scientific terms. You know, he's always changing his form. He is never in the same form. Satan is not omnipresent, which means that he's present everywhere at the same time. Only God is omnipresent. So Satan is not everywhere, but he is a shape shifter. He has a strong network. He has a strong kingdom. Jesus compliments on his kingdom in Matthew chapter 12. He points out that Satan has a kingdom. It's not divided, and it stands. That's a compliment from Jesus. So you're about battling an organized empire of demonic influence. Satan will never show his true form. He is a shape shifter, which means he's always changing. What you think you see is not even what it really is because he's trying to fool you. Paul puts it this way. He, he appears as an angel of light. 
And if it was possible, he'll fool even the very elect. Man, you got to know your word. So we got to get this, these things together. So our discussion on apologetics today is going to rise from this warfare kind of atmosphere and the idea where Paul is in terms of what he's teaching. So I want you to get that in your spirit first. Secondly, the reference materials I'm going to use for this class is the first of all, they have a Bible called the Apologetics Bible. If you don't have one to make a good Bible for you to get, there's a lot of good articles in there that refers to apologetics. It's called the Apologetics Bible. And if I refer a book, you know it must be good. The book I want to refer is Apologetics and Conversation by Vincent Chang. It is a tremendous book on apologetics, really prepares you for warfare. Um, he has a four-part outline to prepare you for spiritual warfare and to really get you into a knowledge base of understanding. So I want to give you these two reference materials for study, uh, the Apologetics Bible and um, Apologetics in Conversation. I, I also, I forgot to put um, a web address on here, but it's called AnswersInGenesis.org, which is a tremendous defense uh, idea. I'm not going to discuss apologetics as a debate format, because um, in my academic background, I have participated in numerous debates in many universities and everything to debate issues, to debate uh, theological terms and, and to debate concepts. And I'm not going to teach you apologetics from a debate standpoint, because I don't want you debating anybody. What we need to do is learn how to defend ourselves. Once we know what apologetics really is, we need to know how to defend the gospel. So there are three things. Here's our flow is going to be. I mentioned it to you earlier. I want to mention it again. When we talk about uh, uh, warring in the spirit with apologetics, we talk about knowing God's God himself, first of all, and then God's word. That's what we have to know. That's what we are today. We have to know who God is, and we have to know God's word. That's extremely important. Both of those concepts are important to where we are. In prayer, we have to be careful of our words, our words, and our passion, because our passion comes forth very strong in prayer. Just give me a preview of prayer. But our words are extremely important. I think the greatest prayer is Psalms 19 and 14. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight, because you want your words to be acceptable to God. Romans 8.26 says we don't know what to pray for as we are. But the Spirit has to make intercession. Well, you need to know how to war in the Spirit. We hear the term and people use it as a buzzword, but they don't really know how to war in the Spirit. War in the Spirit is not using your emotions. And we think it's about being emotional. It's not being, that's not war in the Spirit. That's supplicating. When we're using our emotions, we groan, we make sounds, we're supplicating, we go over, and supplication is good. But that's not how it's done. In fact, to be very effective in prayer, let me tell you that the way to really be effective in prayer is get women together. Every positive example on prayer in the Gospels, Jesus uses women. The one that's very important to me that I like is in Luke 12 when he gives the woman who goes to the judge. She's persistent. And her persistence causes a judge who neither fears God nor man to change his mind because of a woman's persistence. Yes, sir. It's a woman's persistence who reaches through the crowd and touches Jesus and touches a vein in Jesus. With the whole crowd pressing, it's a woman. Jeremiah said when they got ready to go into battle with the Syrians, he said, call for those wailing women. I'm just giving you a preview, I'm, 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 and I'm, I'm trying to explain to you that while we're trying to suppress women, there's something about reaching heaven through women when they wail that a man can't do. But there's a voice of command that a man has and leadership that women can't do. And see, the partnership is that women break the atmosphere. Men command the atmosphere. I wanted to balance that out. Mm -hmm. And if we don't cooperate, because you can't command what's not broken. So there are a lot of men trying to command when they haven't even broken through the walls. 
And so your commands go on empty ears because you got barriers that are in the way of what you're saying. And all you're doing is bouncing back and echoing in your own chamber. But when we empower women to break the barriers, and Jesus, Jesus uses some positive examples of women praying in the Gospels, uh, and I'll cover that in a prayer session. I'm just giving you a preview. But he gives some powerful examples of women praying in the Gospels that are awesome and, and just talks about where they are. And there are just some examples in Scripture of how when women get together. I was fascinated. The other day I heard a care commercial, a group called Care to that sends goods overseas and everything. You know what they said in that commercial? They found out the best way to get to starving people and doing things was to get to the women. So they found out the best way is to use women. Paul Cho, when he was, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, at one point he had the largest church in the world. He's in Seoul, Korea. Well, when he started launching out his prayer ministry and expanding his church, when he went into China, he would use women to set up cell groups. And after they set them up, he had men come in to run the church. Well, they would set up the cell groups and get everybody committed to Christianity. And when the men came in to run it, it would go down. So he realized what he needed to do is just keep the women in power. Instead of trying. Now, there's something to be said about male leadership, and there's something said about women's servanthood. So we have to balance those things out in mind. I don't think we have to get gender crazy. And a lot of us do. We try to worry about who God uses. And I, my statement is always, who made you a policeman for the anointing? Because none of us can police what God is doing. Can the thing created say to the creator, what are you doing? What we need to look at is the effectiveness, not who's doing it, but how effective they are. Now people say, can a woman be a bishop? Can a woman do this? And my thing is, is look at the results. Stop looking at the person and look at the results. Are the results positive or negative? Because that could be a man. Doesn't matter if it's a woman. So you have, to, you have to look at what's going on in order to properly get it in mind. Worship your expression and your reaction. Your expression, how you worship. Your reaction, what do you do with your worship? Now, I hope I'm sparking your interest. This is just part one. It's going to be part two and part three. It's going to take us through this entire year. I guarantee I'm preparing you for 2012. It's so important. This is a transitional year, a very transitional year in the body of Christ. And let me, let me say, the, the prosperity of the 90s in the church, the church became very prosperous in the 90s, was to prepare us for the calamities in the decade of the 2000s. We missed our moment because we heaped up our prosperity in, our, in the 90s and what we wanted to do for ourselves. And the church became a selfish empire instead of a warring kingdom. And so what we see in nature that's happening now, let me tell you prophetically, is that all nature, all, everything is groaning and waiting in and, 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 uh, Romans 8 for the manifestation of the sons of God. Creation is flexing its muscles because it's known that the end is near. That's called eschatology, the study of last things. And so everybody's concerned now with the end of days. And the reason why the end of days is becoming so important is because people looking at how nature and creation, the atmosphere is changing. We, we're talking about wars everywhere. We're talking about all these natural changes in the atmosphere. That's why you got to start praying now. It's because the thing that changes whatever is going on, there is a reaction that's going on, an evolutionary reaction that's going on in the world, in creation that changes its pattern through the church. Prayer upsets the atmosphere. It changes the natural order of things. Things don't have to be what they are if you pray. And I'm getting ahead of myself, so let me, let me move on. <laughs> I'm so, because see, they have to go into sort of knowledge, prayer, and worship. It's not that you do them one at a time. They should be a cycle where you're doing all of them. 
you're, you're getting your knowledge base together because if you got your knowledge base together, you know how to pray right.